And Elva leaves the pits. Red Parnell signals to Moss that he's in the lead, the Porsche having made it stop to refuel, change wheels and drivers. The Ecurie Ecosse D-type Jaguar, driven by Flockhart and Beckhart, comes into the pits, and there's another 90 minutes motor racing still to go. Between 1948 and 1966, it, it is true to say that Goodwood was actually really the spiritual home of motor racing in Britain. It was the place everybody wanted to be. And I think the reason for that was mainly because the ninth Duke of Richmond was such, such a passionate enthusiast and he knew what people wanted. So all the great drivers came, all the great teams came and some of the most important races were held here, you know. I mean, we had the Goodwood Nine Hours, which uh, went into the night. It was a fantastic experience. And then, of course, Easter Monday was the big meeting. You know, we had a Formula One race on Easter Monday. Everybody who loved motor racing came to Goodwood on Easter Monday. It was just the place to be. For all those years, it, it, it really was an important part of international motor racing, absolutely. It was a well-liked venue, that was the thing. It was popular with the crowds, it was popular with the competitors, and it was a great schoolroom circuit. And I think the Duke just felt, you know, the circuit had, had been a glorious success, it had done exactly what he wanted to do. And I think he felt, you know, it was just time to stop. That certainly became true during 1965. And he decided that they would uh, close the circuit to current racing in 66, which uh, in midsummer with the last members meeting, they did. My father, closed the, uh, the circuit to motor racing in 1966. I came back down here three years after that in 1969 and I decided that um, I wouldn't disturb the situation at all because my father had started the motor racing and therefore I should respect his decision to stop it and therefore I decided not to do anything until he, until he had passed on. It was generally known when they ran that last meeting that it was going to be the last at Goodwood and the circuit would be closed thereafter to racing but it would be maintained as um, a venue for sprints uh, just against the clock one car at a time and uh, also for testing and it was testing, really, that ensured the circuit's survival. For those of us who lived anywhere near Goodwood, it was a wonderful time. Because what happened was that once the circuit had closed for racing, all the teams began to uh, come here to test. I mean, everybody came here testing. McLaren came, Dan Gurney came with the Eagle, Jackie Stewart had his first test for Tyrrell here. The Ford GT40 was first developed here. I remember Richie Gint for testing it here. Everybody came, I mean, Honda brought their Formula One car here when they came into Formula One. It was amazing. And uh, if you lived locally, you'd hear them in the morning and you'd think, who's that? And you'd come bicycling over or running over there was, there was no sort of security or, or keep out or anything. As long as you knew how to behave at a racing circuit, uh, you could come and watch. It was, it was incredible. Almost every day there was something fascinating here. So although there was a sadness about there being no racing, it, the word soon got round, you know, if you want to see the new Can-Am McLaren, you can just look over the hedge at Goodwood and there it is. But the thing about Goodwood for testing was that it was a brilliant place to see what a car could do because it's got, it's got everything. 
it's got long fast corners, it's got the chicane, it's got long, a long straight, and it's got a flow to it where you can, you know, after a day's testing, you really can get a brilliant idea of what this car can do and what it can't do. So also, it was pretty private, you know. I mean, it's not a built up area, is it? So although there were lots of sort of, you know, mad enthusiasts like me who'd creep in and watch, uh, I'm talking about a handful of people. I think it's almost um, best to describe the timeline of what happened to the Goodwood motor circuit between 1966 and, say, 1996, those 30 years, um, as being frozen in aspic. It sat here, it was used, it mouldered away around the edges. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. It was not a pretty place by 1996. The circuit itself, the surface and so on, was pretty good, but the periphery was, was rotting away, really. The old concrete barriers that Freddie March had designed and had installed right at the beginning, 1949, 1950, were crumbling away. Uh, some of the concrete had spalled off and you could see the rusty reinforcing steel inside. <laughs> Uh, the banks themselves had eroded with rainfall and snow and so on over the years. They no longer had a vertical face, they sloped, and they were fronted with um, stacks of old motor tyres, which was uh, really a, a, a fig leaf to cover up the fact that they were launching ramps all the way around the course. That's what they'd become. Uh, the old cafeteria building on the outside here, just behind me, opposite the pits, um, that was really a kind of woodworm infested, rotting hulk. The pits had been much diminished. There were only four or five pits here, uh, just at this end, in scaffold pole and corrugated iron. Um, it was a much diminished place. Uh, in contrast to the aerodrome, really, the infield airfield had been developed over the years and they were at the point of building new hangars and so on. And that was pretty much doing better than the circuit itself, I think. A year or so after my father's death, my son said, can we get going again on the motor circuit? And I said, yes. It was just such a wonderful piece of timing that a man like Charles March should be taking over the estate in the early 90s because he'd been racing here with his grandfather. They, uh, uh, they, they used to go to the... Um, Freddie March's little caravan down by the chicane and watched the racing from there. Um, I mean, he and I were both here as boys and it, it was just such a perfect piece of timing because his one dream wasn't, it was not the Festival of Speed, it wasn't the members meeting, it was to revive the circuit. That was his big thing right from the word go. But it, but it was a, a mammoth task. In sort of 91, 92, we were thinking we could revive the circuit as our first project, but it soon became pretty clear that that was going to take many, many years, and that's why the Festival of Speed came to be. My involvement with regenerating the circuit uh, was really as a um, historian, I guess, you know, just somebody who'd been here when it was current and who remembered it pretty well in detail, knew an awful lot of the people involved at that time, and um, had a pretty well-developed pictorial imagination, I guess, for the way it could look, or should look, perhaps. It was a huge task, and you had to have the kind of vision that Charles March has as a photographer, as a creative person, because it was a, a an enormous challenge. Not, not in terms of the circuit itself, because the circuit itself was in good condition. You know, not, not perfect, but you've got to remember there'd been an awful lot of testing, so the circuit 
was not falling apart at all, it was fine. But the rest of the place was, was in a bad state of repair by then. So really, that, that project was separated into three things really. There was the politics, because we had to get planning permission to start racing again, and that meant a lot of negotiating with the local authority. Then there was the, the acoustics, because local people had started to get concerned about the noise coming back to the circuit. So we had to think about how we were going to, as far as possible, keep that noise within the circuit. And thirdly, it was, what do we build? How much do we build? And that's where Charles March was very clever. If you look at the pit lane as it is today, it's probably, for me anyway, it's the, the most successful part of, the, of New Goodwood, if you like. It's got a period feel about it, but it's practical and it works and it's smart. Very early on, it became apparent there would be opposition from local people, especially in Summersdale, which is the closest residential area to the circuit. And they formed an action group, which came as no surprise to us, but they, they formed something they called the Environmental Protection Group. And they were writing letters to the Churchester Observer, and I thought, this is, this is not on. So I, I wrote letters supporting the return of racing at Goodwood and so did another guy called Mike Lawrence. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll find his phone number and ring him up. So I did, and I looked him up in the phone book. And we had a long telephone chat, and he said it would be a good idea if we set up a sports association. I said, fantastic. Um, let's, let's get our friends together. So we had a meeting in the Anglesey Arms just up the road. And there were five members, and those became the committee the Goodwood Sports Association and we, we sort of let it be known by word of mouth. It ended up in the end um, with two and a half thousand members and we held, we held meetings in um, hotels and eventually in the, um, the Great Hall of um, Chichester, what's now Chichester University, then Bishop Robert College. And we had retired racing drivers like John Surtees, Derek Bell, um, Tony Brooks, and a wonderful evening with Murray Walker. We used to get three to four hundred people turn up for these um, these evenings, and they were they were a great success. You know, we used to charge them a small amount to join. When it came to the the planning permission um, application was going through, but eventually it became um, it, it was decided, I think, that they had to have a meeting of the entire council to to decide this, and at the final council meeting, we had councillors standing up saying, I have 53 letters of support and only two against. And so the planning permission was given. It went through 13 to 8, which we, we were delighted about. Uh, once we decided uh, to keep the track exactly as it was, um, I guess it was quite easy in many ways to, um, to do the job because the brief was kind of, in many ways, how it had been, or certainly how people imagined it had been. We couldn't build a pit lane. The pit lane, as it used to be, was entirely inappropriate, so we had to build that in the kind of, in the style of. Um, but actually, if you look at it, it's in fact quite a modern building. It's an interesting building. The very lovely old sort of wartime buildings are around on the site. We, we, we had to rebuild all of those. The track, thankfully, had never been destroyed um, or dug up, um, though the surface was, was a bit rickety in places, but basically that didn't require a huge amount of work. And then, of course, there were, the, there were the planning issues and the safety issues. So we had to, we had to put a, a proper bank all the way around the circuit. We had to put in acoustic banks as well. So in the end, we, we, we decided to build an entire bank around the whole track, which worried me a bit um, because I felt that might change the feel of the circuit, it might, the geography. So there is this high-level bank now around the whole circuit which kind of undulates. You don't really, really feel it. And if anything, I think it's hugely enhanced everyone's experience of Goodwood. The architect, Brian, who, who drew it all, I think did a jolly good job of taking the general ambience, the general form of the original pits, 
and, and doing a sort of a modernised version of them. But whereas the old original pits were the most rickety, rackety, flimsy, cheap structure of scaffold poles and corrugated iron, much of which had mouldered away over the years, the new pits, you know, were constructed of, of massive steels and concrete and block. It looks similar, in essence, to the view that one would have had from the opposite side of the track during the 50s and 60s. The whole feel of Goodwood, whether it be Goodwood House or the race course or, the, or this circuit or the estate itself, has a has a, a beauty about it, doesn't it? You know, it has a it has a if you like a sort of rural feel. Hence, seven hundred thousand daffodils for the members' meeting. This paddock is almost the same as the paddock always was, except the the ground is a lot smarter. Um, it's a lot tidier. There's nice tarmac down, whereas it used to be um, a bit patchy and a bit gravelly. But these paddock shelters are are. Um, almost exactly the same as they were. I mean, they're better built and the the roofs are a bit more secure, but it's very, it's very similar. It has exactly the same feel. It has, I mean, the picket fencing is how it used to be. On the outside of Fordwater here, the ground sloped down. It was a big drop from the circuit edge. And if you stood here at the foot of the old bank left over from the racing period, 48 to 66, the, the circuit edge would have been on a level up here. It would have been above my head. So all of this was built up to provide a, a safer runoff. Um, and the bank itself was moved back a little bit. Not a huge amount in this particular area. It was moved back much further up, up towards St Mary's and beyond St Mary's. But everywhere really around Goodwood, wherever possible, wherever there was space, the bank was moved back to give um, a bit more runoff to what had been here before, while retaining the appearance, the general appearance, of what the circuit had been like, 48 to 66. Other than that, it was just, we had to smarten it up. You know, it was like a refurb, a giant refurb. You know, lots of painting, lots of, lots of new grass, lots of, all that sort of thing. Once in every lifetime, something so magical happens to you that you have to pinch yourself to believe it's true. And for four days now, I have been on the verge of tears of sheer joy at being at this Goodwood revival. The Earl of March and his team have done an absolutely fantastic job bringing the circuit back to life again. They've got some of the finest cars in the world here, and the racing has been absolutely unbelievable. I will just never, ever, ever forget the Friday morning of the first revival in 1998. I think it was, um, we all were, I mean, we were exhausted anyway, after five, six years of, of working on the thing. With the grass absolutely manicured, the flower beds out, you know, everything looking the way it should be. And the weather that first day <laughs> of that first revival meeting, it was just the most sublime, coastal Sussex autumn day with a, that kind of soft light that you get because of the salt in the air from the sea um, and it was just beautiful all these pastel shades and the whole weekend was like that we were just unbelievably lucky and when those cars came out it was like you had to pinch yourself you know <laughs> it was just I just remember them coming out of the assembly area and going up towards Madrid. And by that time, Ray Hannah had flown the Spitfire down the pit straight, which was mind blowing in itself. It was a beautiful morning. And I think we just thought, we've done it. We've actually done it. You know, we're going racing at Goodwood again. Amazing feeling.
I was very worried that with a, a, effectively a brand new circuit, we were going to have drivers pootling around, being very worried that this was one of the fastest circuits in the country. But I was watching the first, the first practice session and the first car out was Willie Green in an Alfa Romeo 159. And I was watching from Woodcote Corner and as he came into Woodcote Corner, he broke all four wheels away and went round the whole thing in a slide. And I thought, yes, <laughs> we're back in practice. I remember there was an extraordinary moment with um, Charles March, his father, the Duke, myself, I think Rob Widows. Um, and we started off just by shaking hands at the end of the pits. And it ended up in a big group hug. And I'm not a terribly huggy pit person. I remember standing there, I think we looked like a bunch of idiots <laughs> standing here. But it was just a sort of spontaneous thing that it, all, all these months and months of, uh, of hard work and um, years of ambition and hope and all the rest of it uh, uh, finally come to this. And then on the Sunday evening at the end of, uh, the end of that first revival meeting, um, I was with Robert Brooks and Ludovic Lindsay, who'd won the first race here in his late father's ERA. And we'd been to the pie stall that was at the back of Grandstand by the chicane. <laughs> now we standing there, each with a pie in our hand. <laughs> and a military band um, was um, playing um, the Oki Koki up on the roof of the pits. And um, old Mother Brown, knees up Mother Brown. And uh, <laughs> they were all thumping away, knees up Mother Brown. And Robert turned to, to Ludovic and I and said, doesn't get better than this, does it? And with the sunset in the background and this sort of pinky orange sky, you know, it, it was brilliant. <laughs>